Heads up, this episode includes spoilers, adult themes, and conversation about fictional moments of self-harm. We love you, so please listen with care. You there, Remy? Mm-hmm, I'm here. How are you doing? I'm great. It's all been really wonderful. There's a sequence I keep thinking about in Sofia Coppola's new biopic, Priscilla. It's 1963, and 17-year-old Priscilla Bulia has left her military family in Germany to live at Graceland, the home of her boyfriend, soon-to-be husband, Elvis Presley. It hasn't really been wonderful. He's always away on movie shoots. She's got no friends at her new Catholic high school. Even if she did, she's not allowed to bring him home. And getting a job? We don't have to forget about that. I thought it could be fun. Well, it's either me or career, baby. When I call you, I need you to be there for me. Even when Elvis gets home from Hollywood, he shyly declines to have sex with her. But then, one morning, okay. he greets her at Graceland's door with an invitation to get off this lonely island for a minute. I'll be on. I'll take you shopping. Her face lights up, ruby music kicks in, and cut to a luxurious boutique. Oh, look at that. <laughs> With Elvis and his buddies looking on, Priscilla tries on a string of gorgeous dresses in sophisticated gray, baby blue. I like you in blue, yeah. Blue's your color. She smiles, even when Elvis rejects one she likes in patterned brown. I'm solid suit you better. I, I hate brown. It reminds me of the army. And she keeps smiling when he straight up dictates the rest of her look. Black hair and more eye makeup will make your eyes stand out more. Mm-hmm. It's four o'clock, boys. We gotta go. Barbecue's waiting. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. If you had to sum up Sofia Coppola's movies in one scene, I'd suggest this one: a young woman, alone in a difficult, beautiful world, surrounded by beautiful fashion, that offers escape, or imprisonment, or both. Rico Galliano, welcome back to the Movie Podcast. Movies, the streaming service that champions great cinema. On this show, we tell you the stories behind great cinema. This is season five. We're calling it Tailor Made because every week we're diving into fashion on film and why it matters. Last few episodes, we've been looking at individual movies. This time, we're looking at a bunch of them by a very individual filmmaker, Sofia Coppola. From day one, her movies have been celebrated for their dreamy photography and fashions. You'll find practically every frame from every one of them posted and raved about on Instagram. But she's not quick to tell you what it all means. I remember my dad, he gave me a book of the Dictionary of Poetry and said, you know, films are the same as poetry. So I think it's in the same way you can't really describe what it is and it expresses something that you can't really articulate. But we're going to try anyway. I spoke to Coppola, her costume designers past and present, and many more to figure out where her fashion fascination came from and how it goes hand in hand with the central theme of her work, the lives of young women out of place. So doff your pink karaoke wig and kick off your converse as we rip open the scenes of a few films by Sofia Coppola. To figure out the building blocks of Coppola's, or really anyone's style, I figure you gotta start with their roots. And the first thing I flashed on was this. There have been stories in the press about production problems with the film. Has the filming been delayed? Well, we're behind, but uh, we have not stopped shooting. That's Sophia's dad, Francis, in the documentary Hearts of Darkness, about the making of his movie Apocalypse Now, on location in the Philippines. I would say it's it's twice the scope in terms of uh, the production of any film I've done, including the two Godfathers together. Sitting topless in a director's chair. Elsewhere in the movie, you see him in sweat-stained shirts, maybe the occasional safari jacket. Not high fashion is what I'm saying. I'm reminded, though, that's not the whole picture. Yeah, my name is Roman Coppola. I'm a filmmaker. 
Roman's, of course, also Sophia's brother and her sometimes producer and second unit director. You know, my dad has had different modes of dress on, on different films. He wore a corduroy suit for much of my childhood and on, on the set of his films oh, on, yeah. during Apocalypse. He was, you know, in a T-shirts and shorts just because it was so hot. And that was sort of the <laughs> uniform of the time. Yeah, actually type Francis Coppola 80s into Google and you'll see him in some pretty styling knit ties and Panama hats. Still, I get the feeling maybe even more influential was the family matriarch, Eleanor. Yes, she has a collection of fabrics and she loves fabric as art, woven fabric or embroidery, or uh, she's very interested in Japan and Japanese culture and tie-dye thing called shiburi, which is has all these little knots that create these patterns. So in her home, often we'll have a fabric on display. So I brought this up to Sophia. Oh, yeah. And she seemed pleased I made the connection. Yes, I, I think... I think we inherited that from her. You think that influenced your aesthetics? Yeah, definitely. And she just exposed us to, she was interested in contemporary art mm. where my dad wasn't. So she would always drag us to the museum and we'd be complaining <laughs> and always appreciate like the importance of beauty. Like she, she never felt like beauty was frivolous. She felt like it was really essential. I think I got that from her, definitely. Yeah, I feel like that almost defines a certain kind of artist. Like they, they want to live their lives aesthetically like the most important thing is to be around beautiful yeah. things you think that's true uh, yeah for me it is like i um, and i and i know that about my my mom for sure is very sensitive to uh, her environment like she really wilts if she's not in a beautiful setting because my my dad is in georgia right now filming and he took an old motel and was like really excited to like live in this old motel and my mom's <laughs> like I, I can't live in the motel like it, and it's not a snobby thing i just think that she's very sensitive to her environment and i I, yeah. can relate, I can relate to that. I can see that, especially part of being a director is that you get to create this world exactly how you imagine it. And pretty early on, the world she imagined seemed to come from the pages in a certain kind of magazine. Well, Sophia has always been drawn to fashion. As a kid, she had, you know, subscription to Vogue and you know, made uh, tear sheets and drew imagery of, you know, women with dresses. From there, Sophia says she got into fashion photography and later started shooting her own art photography, spurred on by a teacher who said she had what at the time was a pretty unique point of view. In the 90s, there was a photographer called Hero Mix and there was a lot of this kind of like girl culture snapshot photography, which now just looks, you know, like Instagram or something. But at that time, it was really unusual that... Wow you know, the girls taking pictures of their messy bedrooms and stuff like that. And that I was really connected to that of kind of like a girl's environment, a girl in their bedroom and that kind of world. Which is interesting because it sounds like growing up, the last place she spent much time in was her room. This is another moment from Hearts of Darkness, by the way, co-directed by Eleanor Coppola, who narrated from her own diaries. This is the first day of heavy rain. A typhoon is off the coast. I've never seen it rain so hard. Water has started coming in the rooms downstairs and Sophia is splashing around in it. Francis has decided to make pasta and he's turned on La Boheme full volume. Yeah, for long stretches, Sophia and her family were kind of filmmaking nomads living location to location as her dad's shoots demanded. I was only thinking of, I gotta shoot tomorrow. She has described it as a blissful time, like growing up in the circus. But it wasn't all joy. Her mom struggled with being a creative, whose main job was now tending to the family while her husband made films. And the travel took some toll, in ways Sophia shares with the hero of her latest movie. I relate to, like Priscilla being an army brat, I can relate to that because I always went to new schools I, I don't know how to, I can't multiply. I can't do math. I can't help my daughters with their homework because I never learned how to multiply because I switched schools at that age. I barely graduated high school because I, I missed a bunch of uh, math that was, that made it a nightmare in high school after that. Wow. So in a way, I mean, like you can identify with a Priscilla, this person that was like taken out of the, the, the mainstream in a way. Well, I'd, and that thing of always being the new kid at school, I could really relate to that. So any scene about the new kid at school, I was always the new kid. So it's maybe no surprise her very first feature was about schoolgirls hustled away from the typical world. And even the first 15 minutes set the themes for a lot of her films and fashions to come. What are you doing here, honey? You're not even old enough to know how bad life gets. Obviously, doctor. You've never been a 13-year-old girl. 
The Virgin Suicides is based on the book by Jeffrey Eugenides. Set in an idyllic looking 70s suburbia, it tells the wry, dark fable of the five beautiful teenage Lisbon sisters, who to the local boys are mysterious objects of desire. No one could understand how Mrs. Lisbon and Mr. Lisbon, our math teacher, had produced such beautiful creatures. So the guys can't figure out at first why one sister, Cecilia, starts the movie by, yes, attempting suicide. But her psychologist tells her parents he thinks he knows why. I know you're very strict, but I think that Cecilia would benefit by having a social outlet outside of the codification of school. Yeah, her kind but conservative folks keep their budding daughters safely sequestered at home. For Cecilia's sake, though, they let the kids throw the world's most adorably awkward mixer in the basement. Um, how do your SATs go? Okay. But Cecilia just watches blithely from the sidelines and heads upstairs. <gasps> Ronald! Cecilia! And tosses herself out the window onto the metal picket fence in the front yard. <gasps> no! No, no, no. Don't look to the right. Turn around. I mean, I grew up on a lot of older films, a lot of like lean and a lot of like epics. Roxana Haddadi is a TV critic and pop culture writer for Vulture and just wrote a great piece about Coppola's use of costumes. But I remember Virgin Suicides just doing something else, making me think about myself as a woman and all the times that I had felt lonely or unseen. Mm. But I also remember that it made me really like that feeling, <laughs> which I think is what all of her movies do, right? There's this very like bittersweet, melancholy, you like being sad while you're watching them because it also makes you feel recognized. Like a recognition that a lot of times there's only a sliver of room for young women to take some agency over their lives. I mean, I think all of her movies, aside from maybe something like On the Rocks, I mean, even On the Rocks, <laughs> what most of them are doing is this sort of like weaponized femininity thing. It's knowing what other people expect of you and what you're supposed to look like as a girl of a certain age, as a woman of a certain age, in a certain social rank, so it's knowing all of those things, being aware of them, and trying to exert some sort of identity or control over other people's perceptions of you. Because you can't control a lot of things. You can't control men. <laughs> you can't control the larger patriarchal society. You can't control capitalism. But maybe the one specific thing you can control is how you look. It's an idea that's right there, super subtly, in Suicide's first act, when right before the basement party, the girls suit up in their parent-approved dresses. And Cecilia's? It's like a white lace dress, and I think she's wearing beaded bracelets. Oh yeah, one sister actually uh, helps her put them on to cover up the bandages on her wrists, I think. There. Is that okay? I gotta get dressed. And I remember thinking that was so specific for her to be wearing like this white, religious, angelic outfit. And then the very specific beaded bracelets that I imagine her making at home by herself, maybe with her sisters. So she's got the virginal outfit from her parents, but with this like one little symbol of defiance, a symbol of herself. Yeah. That is definitely what I'm getting at. It's that sense of trying to find a way to do both because you're being forced into what other people expect for you. And you're trying to just do one thing that is about you. Now, if that seems like too small a detail on which to base a unifying theory of Coppola's costume choices, well, two movies later, the theme was hard to miss because like much else in it, the clothes were cranked up to 11. This is ridiculous. This, madame, is Versailles. <laughs> Obviously, Marie Antoinette, like 14 years old, married off to the Dauphin of France and sort of placed onto this track to be the royal wife. You're stripped away from your family and you're in a new place and you have to be a figure. Like primarily you are a figure to your husband and to the people and that's it. Yeah, it's like sit in this gorgeous palace and create a baby, create an heir, and that's all you're needed for. Yes. <laughs> the gilded cage, right? 
I mean, so primarily in this film, the costumes are just getting like more and more elaborate. Like it's just bigger and bigger ball gowns. They are like a riot of color and detail. They get more and more absurd and frilly and girly. Because it's like the one thing that she can do. She can't, since she can't leave the castle for the most part, she can't do anything else. The one thing she's got is to just get bigger and bigger dresses. Yes, bigger and bigger. And I think it's like cosplaying as herself. Like if I'm going to be queen, then I'm going to take up the most space. I'm going to do the most things. I'm going to be the queenliest queen, right? (laughs) Everything is just more and more maximalist, I think. Again, the very small amount of control she has is over what she wears. Of course, ironically, the most celebrated piece of clothing in Antoinette was the least maximalist. And according to the movie's second unit director, Roman Coppola, completely unplanned. There's a pretty well-known shot of the um, the girls trying on shoes, and then in the background you see some Converse All-Stars that are purple. And that was uh, something I shot, and it wasn't scripted, but the photo double who was putting on the shoes, those were her actual shoes, and we thought just for fun to put them in the background, and that was a fun little kind of Easter egg. It ended up being one of many anachronistic touches that made this 18th century costume drama the Coppola flick most embraced by 21st century fashionistas. I mean, the entire approach to this film was that Marie Antoinette was a teenage girl, and you know her. Raisa Britannia is a fashion historian at the Fashion Institute of Technology. And it kind of fits within the timeline of the teen films of the early aughts, like the Mean Girls of the time. And so a lot of the clothing actually has a lot to do with what was happening in fashion at the time. Like? Definitely the color palette. I mean, when you think of millennial pink, that color is very present in the film. I've never heard of millennial pink. (laughs) (laughs) Millennial pink, it's this distinct shade of like baby pink. Uh, I know one of the legends from the film is that Coppola gave the designer, Milena Cannonero, a box of La Durée macarons and said, this is your color palette. <laughs> and they became, my understanding is those those macarons became kind of a thing after that movie, right? Because you see her eating them. Yes, I remember them being immensely popular. And you had Manolo Blahnik designing the shoes. And so in that fabulous, like, getting ready scene, when you see all of the shoes lined up, I mean, it's meant to generate a sense of desire. And that absolutely makes you want to go out and buy a pair of Manolo Blahnik shoes. Which makes for a second irony. Because just a couple films later, Coppola would make a satire about a gang of Audi's kids who covet high fashion. We unstitch the curious case of the bling ring and turn Coppola's personal style inside out. Coming up in just a minute, stay with us. All right, everybody, Mubi is the curated streaming service that champions great cinema wherever we find it from any country, whether it's made by legendary auteurs or brilliant first timers. We have always got something new for you to discover. And actually, let's talk about a first time director, maybe one of the heirs apparent to Sofia Coppola, actually. That would be British filmmaker Molly Manning Walker. Her debut feature, How to Have Sex, is in select theaters in the U.S. now and is also already on Mubi in the U.K. and elsewhere. Like a lot of Coppola's work, this is a story about a young woman in search of identity, but in a way more raucous kind of world, a modern-day party town in Greece. That's where a U.K. teenager goes on a holiday with her girlfriends in search of bonding and to lose her virginity, which ends up happening in a very confusing and life-altering way. This thing is full of color and energy. It is a real rush. But then it deals with issues of consent in a way that was actually very sobering to me. Actor Mia McKenna-Bruce just won the Rising Star Award at the BAFTAs in England for her work in the main role. You are going to want to keep an eye on her. So let me humbly suggest you go back a few episodes and listen to my interview with Molly Manning Walker about how to have sex. Again, it is now streaming in the UK and Latin America. And if you're in the US, you can catch it in theaters now or streaming on movies starting April 5th. We have got all the info you need in the show notes of this episode. Speaking of which, let's get back to it. So it's 2013, and Sofia Coppola puts out her seventh film. It's the one that most explicitly makes fashions part of the storyline, the movie where her main characters are most obsessed with clothes, 
And yet, if you ask Sophia, it's also her least pretty. That one was the hardest for me visual visually because it's it's not um, a beautiful aesthetic. So that that part was hard, but it was. Um, it, it, you you don't think that it's an aesthetic world? I mean, in some ways, I think it's an alluring world. Oh, yeah. I guess you know it has it has appeal, but it's also not attractive at the same time. It's not beautiful. I wouldn't say. It was called The Bling Ring, a super entertaining outlier in Coppola's canon, and one I think is kind of key to understanding her personal take on fashion. Okay, so these are her sunglasses, and that's her bathroom, and there's her closet. The Bling Ring Um, is based on a true story circa 2008 about a group of teens at a SoCal quote-unquote dropout school who scoured the internet to figure out when celebrities like Paris Hilton were out of town, then traipsed into their mansions, and looted their designer clothes and jewelry, around three million bucks worth. Look at all her Louboutins. Oh, her feet are so big. Coppola has some sympathy for these people. Her main character, Nick, is, yes, the shy new kid at school, looking for a way to shine. And along with the kids, her camera gets practically drunk on the piles of decadent outfits and accessories in Paris Hilton's actual palatial closets, plural. Oh my God! Dude, 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 she's got her own line. But even so... We did think of it as a cautionary tale. It was like, if you went to the movies and ate an entire bucket of popcorn, like it kind of felt good going down, but then you felt sick. That is Stacey Batat. She has done the costume design for all Coppola's films since 2010, including this one. It's more than just about fashion. It's also kind of a social commentary on people's desire to be noticed and to be attention grabbers and to emulate what somebody like Paris Hilton in the early 2000s was like. She was famous for being famous. And I think like they just wanted that notoriety and that wealth. And then they wanted to dress the part. Yeah. When Sophia says the movie's visual aesthetic isn't beautiful, I think this is a big part of what she's talking about. Like she's not interested. I think Sophia likes clothes a lot, but she's also not interested in labels necessarily or like uh, status. And I think in the bling ring, like what they're after is status and how that status is expressed through clothes. Mm. They wanted the thing that was the most recognizable, the bag with the biggest CCs on it. (laughs) And I like just knowing Sophia as well as I do, she's not interested in status. She's interested in a beautiful French seam on the inside of her shirt. What is a French seam? I don't know, that clueless. It's like a nice, like they basically fold it under and sew the seam. So it looks really nice on the inside. You could flip the shirt inside out and wear it. It's just a beautiful tailoring, and I think that's what Sophia is interested in. She is interested in the delicacy and the artistry, but not in the status. Like, you can't see the inside of her shirt. To get an idea of this subtle look, just check out Scarlett Johansson in 2003's Lost in Translation, made towards the end of Coppola's marriage to director Spike Jones. You know, the script was kind of about Sophia and Spike, and so... I think we were dressing Scarlett a bit like Sophia. That is Nancy Steiner. She was the costume designer. And she never said that to me. She never said it. But, I mean, I was dressing her similar. And Scarlett was 17 or 18. And so she felt like it was very conservative, what we were doing. Yeah, you can spot other young American characters in the movie wearing standard 2003 style. Low-cut jean skirts or hip-hop puffy vests. But ScarJo wanders Tokyo in tasteful slacks or skirts, a dress shirt and sweater, a dark peacoat. Even the film's infamously revealing opening shot of Scarlet, inspired by a photo from artist John Cassera, goes for something classic. Of course, I always get questions about the underwear in the first scene. That's a big one. I forgot. Thank you for <laughs> reminding me. I mean, like that might be the most iconic piece of clothing in her mm-hmm. entire oeuvre. But as far as choosing the underwear, we had a plethora to choose from. And some were transparent and some weren't. And some had lace and some didn't. And Sophia picked the beautiful see-through. Just very simple. Simple. That's a phrase people I talked to used a lot to describe Coppola's style sense. Also, Timeless. On her sets, she's known to wear a uniform of just a well-made Charvet dress shirt and pants. And I tell you this because in her new film, Priscilla, that's kind of what Coppola's main character wears. Eventually. 
Wow. Oh, wow. Well, we have a winner right here. Absolutely. I like you in blue. Yeah. Blue's your color. You remember this scene from the top of the episode, right? Elvis, circa 1963, telling 17-year-old Priscilla Presley how he wants her to style herself. Blue dresses, no brown or prints, and... Black hair and more eye makeup will make your eyes stand out more. She is a little bit of like a, uh, a little bit of a kept doll. That's Vulture's Roxana Haddadi once again, and she says at this point, you can almost turn the sound down on the movie and still track this relationship just through Stacey Batat's costumes, which on Priscilla herself follow a familiar pattern at first. Elvis sort of gives her what her look is going to be. And then most of the film is her doing that. Um, and as we saw Marie Antoinette do, she, it's getting like the look is getting bigger and bigger because her amount of influence in her own life is smaller and smaller. So like the hair gets bigger, the makeup gets more elaborate, the gowns are always beautiful, but they're pretty much always blue because that's what he wants. Um, and we have that for, I'd say, probably like two thirds of the film. But then suddenly. No, no. Oh, come on, Lisa. I'm gonna take Elvis. a picture with Daddy. There's an almost disorienting cut to the mid 1970s. Priscilla, now with the toddler, is doing a magazine photo shoot with Elvis at Graceland. Nice. <laughs> he is in full Vegas mode shimmering blue suit, a giant chin high shirt collar, a scepter like walking cane. But her? It's clear that Priscilla is like ready to leave him. She has washed the black dye out of her hair. It has returned to the shade, like her natural brunette shade. She is no longer wearing only blue. She's wearing pants, which is a big deal because he was very anti-pants. Okay, I think we got it. Lovely. And at the very end, she leaves Elvis in this outfit that is very similar to like what Sophia herself wears, but also to a woman who is trying to project like a certain sense of like self-awareness. So she leaves him in pants yeah, and like a button down Oxford shirt and a blazer. It's like if the project of a lot of the characters in her films is to express themselves through clothes here, that means you got to pair the clothes away. Yep. Yep. This I think is Sophia Coppola's fashion statement. Not that liberation comes from putting on a shirt and pants, but that it starts by stripping off everything that doesn't come from you until you find the French seam underneath. And that's the movie podcast for this week. Follow us for more stories about great filmmakers and their films. Next week, we close out this season with a sort of companion piece to today's episode. It is my full interview with Sofia Coppola about pretty much everything except the costumes in Priscilla, from its source material to its soundtrack. It's really not my era, so some of it can sound corny to me and feel like happy days or something. I grew up with Elvis Costello. Like, that's my Elvis. Music heads, take note and follow us so you don't miss it. Till then, this episode of the Movie Podcast was written, hosted, and edited by me, Rico Galliano. Kira Mac Enif is our producer. Beth Schiff is our booking producer. Stephen Cologne mastered it. Our original music was composed by Martin Ostwick. Extra thanks this week to Rachel Yang and especially Karina Lesser. This show is executive produced by me, along with John Baranichea, F.A. Checkerell, Daniel Kasman, and Michael Taka. If you love the show, tell the world by leaving a five-star review wherever you listen, won't you? Let them know we're something special. Also, if you've got questions, comments, or you want to rage about the Coppola movie we didn't talk about but should have, Sorry, guys, she's made like a dozen of them. Email us at podcast at movie.com. And of course, to stream the best in cinema, including some of the films we talk about on this very podcast, just head over to movie.com to start watching. Thanks for listening. Be safe. And may all your movie outings be worth dressing up for. Mm-hmm.